Welcome to this brief lecture on failure mode and effects analysis, and this introduction is the first part of four parts on this topic. Sometimes we forget that processes can improve with feedback. Let's just take a look at this picture from 1895 and compare that with a picture just a few years later in 1898. What we clearly see is that as opposed to um, the, uh, the surgeons and the clinicians wearing street clothes, now of course with the understanding of bacteria and, and, and contamination, now they're actually wearing um, more surgically uh, recognizable um, uh, gowns. So again, the idea was that uh, it, it never really occurred to people that, um, that, uh, that wearing your street clothes could be a problem, of course, be, but uh, affection and its understanding uh, improved dramatically and processes changed. But it's an interesting fact, okay? Um, you have to get get, a, get accustomed to the idea of people um, taking a look at what you're doing and providing feedback. And FDA is supposed to inspect all medical devices with a class 2, 3, plus, plus devices at least once every two years. So I think the idea here is that don't it would be it would be wrong to think that the uh, FDA audit is unusual. It actually should be an expected and typical part of any product design process. A fundamental part of the audit is to understand hazard and risk analysis and exactly what the company is doing to manage this process. Again, this is taken from medicaldeviceacademy.com, and it underscores the fact that there's a risk assessment component and a risk management pro component to the overall process. So what's the purpose? We kind of remember that the purpose is to design medical devices that minimize patient exposure to unnecessary danger and injury. Some very vague uh, words there, but they're important to remember. Obviously, we want to use the hazard and risk analysis to provide the basis for the analysis of risk to benefit, and that's, of course, important in clinical trials. Certainly, we want to reduce product device recalls, and paramount, we want to improve and provide patient safety. All of this is outlined in ISO 14971. So hazard and risk analysis is very central to audits, and you'll see that in the slides ahead. First, let's talk a little bit about what is the difference between hazard and risk. As we've discussed in class before, a hazard is the potential for human, property, or environmental damage. So it could be real, but potential is the operative word here. And risk is the likelihood of that hazard materializing in practice. Of course, we could dig a little bit more into the idea of of risk with the underlying probabilities and our knowledge of the underlying probabilities and the knowledge about um, outcomes. And I think what we often think of is when we think of risk management is uh, usually having some sort of frequency distribution. But again, uh, just to sort of summarize here, a hazard is the potential for damage and the risk is the likelihood of that hazard materializing. <clears throat> risk management is a very well-known process. Okay, it's all well known and it's audited by, by the FDA. So there's a couple of things to keep in mind when we think about the FDA and we think about risk management. Um, first of all, if you manufacture a medical device, expect to be audited. And since you can expect an audit, then always be prepared. Not only that, but the FDA tells you exactly how they are going to audit you. There's a document on the FDA website that outlines in very specific detail exactly how you'll be audited. Furthermore, the FDA um, <clears throat> has uh, make, makes you aware of issues, all right? And these issues are known as uh, 483 inspectional observations based on the form used to report them. Now, not only do they um, report those issues, but on the FDA website, they also tell you what the common issues are. So let's think about this for a minute. A lot of people get concerned about risk management and, you know, what's the FDA going to do and what's this process look like? I mean, it, first of all, if you manufacture, expect to be audited. If you can expect to be audited, be prepared. The FDA tells you how they're going to audit. 
there's um, they 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 articulate our issues in a very formalized fashion, and they tell you what the common issues are. So really, I think that the risk management process isn't something that should be viewed as um, as, as as difficult or or challenging or uh, a surprise. There's a lot of knowns with regard to risk management. And if you're not sure. Um, and you're internally, your company doesn't exactly provide a lot of guidance. There's so many different consulting and services available. You know, I just quickly Googled and I came up with SGS. You can get all sorts of training. But a lot of the training centers around the ISO uh, 14971, which is medical devices risk management. And um, I think the, um, I think, you know, th this company is, is, is one of, any number of companies that actually can provide these services in condition in, in addition to uh, ASQ in some cases but um, but uh, <clears throat> if you don't know or your company doesn't know there's certainly training available so all of this to simply say that risk management should not be a mystery certainly companies will have different processes for hazard and risk analysis um, so here's a here's a sort of a, a kappa flow diagram and you see that in this for this particular company um, inputs for kappa can be employee suggestions it could be customer feedback production so what this says is internally and externally there's feedback that might drive an engineering change request or and then subsequently result in an engineering change order other people, this is also involves, uh, you know, you can also see the elements of the Kappa here, corrective action process. Uh, and, <clears throat> and so in this particular company, you know, this, uh, they have an observational finding and there's a complaint form and it's formally attended to, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, the, what, what we're trying to convey in this particular uh, slide with these images is that the 14971 is actually something that each company has to interpret for themselves, but there are some best practices and there are plenty of resources out there to help you understand and apply those best practices to your situation. Again, several standardized processes and tools for risk management. It is a process. A couple things to keep in mind. Management controls. You always need to evaluate whether management um, have with executive responsibility, okay, is, uh, is, is, is actively engaged in the risk management process. The engineers would be more familiar with design controls. Certainly the FDA waterfall process uh, through Section 820-3 dictates a lot of elements that the typical designer needs to be aware of. Supplementing this is, like I mentioned in the last slide, the corrective and preventable actions. And <clears throat> I've taken from the ASQ org website what the purpose of the CAPA subsystem is, but basically it's really this data collection and analysis system for the investigation of quality problems. And within that framework, there's a failure modes and effect analysis uh, uh, root, um, process. And what this is, is a process for identifying failures throughout the product life cycle. Okay? So just to summarize, um, in a risk management process, we certainly want to have management controls. We want to know that people who have responsible fiduciary responsibility and executive responsibility are engaged. We want to know that the engineers understand what design controls are, that they're responsive and responsible regarding the FDA waterfall process. And then in anticipation of any device not being less than perfect through the first round of a design, we have CAPA, which is a corrective and preventable action, and we also have uh, failure modes and effect analysis. These are two tools that help us um, really execute the quality process. Many different places to go for things like failure modes and effect analysis. Um, ASQ has uh, a considerable amount of information, and this website is uh, is very informative. Um, you know, talks about the uh, the, the failure modes and effect is a step by step approach to identifying all possible failures. It goes down and dis describes and defines various parameters, and of course, this is something that was begun back in the, uh, in the 1940s, so this has been around for quite a long time. So no question, there's a lot of information out there. Um, there's probably, it's hard to imagine that a company should not have a rigorous FMEA process in place. And of course, one of the things we want to do in this course is introduce the FMEA to you so you're familiar with it as a part of the design process. 
So let's really quick, quickly look at when do you use an FMEA. Um, you actually use it in design or manufacturing process situations. So this could be preliminary design, final design, um, this could be manufacturing. So essentially use a failure modes and effect analysis when a process, product, or service being designed or redesigned or after a quality function deployment. Some of you would know QFD is the voice of the customer. We also use it when an existing process, product, or service is being applied in a new way. So when, you, um, when you're going to repurpose a design, you need to run an FMEA to predict and anticipate whatever problems might occur. Again, when you de develop control plans for a new or modified process, you might have uh, a manufacturing process where a stamping has produced some concerns. Maybe there's corrosion, maybe there's uh, deformations. And so you're going to consider a new manufacturing process. If you consider a new manufacturing process, then you better run an FMEA to anticipate the difficulties. Again, improvement goals are planned for a, 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 an existing process. So uh, improvement, um, you want to uh, increase the durability, increase the life. Whenever there's a design change or a process change, you're going to kick in an FMEA to anticipate any problems that might have existed. Certainly, you're going to do this when you're analyzing failures. So if you think back to that summary of the kappa, you know, that's going to be, let's suppose a kappa originates from a customer complaint or a failure in the in field. This is a trigger for uh, FMEA to be used to analyze the failures. And of course, this is something, a tool, the FMEA is a tool you want to use throughout the life of the product or service just as good quality practice. And no question that ASQ.org and other organizations provide a lot of useful information that can inform the designer about this important process. So what we're going to talk about next is the CAPA, the corrective, action, corrective and Preventative Action Process. And then what we'll do is dig into the FMEA and have a summary. So the next video will be fairly short, um, and we have three parts left. So stay tuned.